Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my channel. I'm your host at Creepy Reading, and today I want to present 20 Let's Not Meet Stories for your viewing consumption. Now understand that this is a part 2 of a 2 part video. If you would like to see the original, please click here and come back again soon. In the meantime, understand that none of the stories here are written by me but rather purported to be true by the users of Let's Not Meet. All of their stories are linked in the description below. I would also like you guys to have a fair extra warning here. Some of the stories here are very graphic in nature, including the next one, which will have subjects of pedophilia and domestic violence involved. So, if things like that will bother you, I highly recommend clicking up the video now is your only option. With that being said, sit back, relax, and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host, That Creepy Reading, and I'm signing off. David, bye. Listen to me right now. When I was younger, probably around 12 to 13 years old, my best friend Tyson and I would regularly have sleepovers. The best part about these sleepovers was the fact that we would sneak out in the middle of the night and go do stupid things like moving around traffic signs, or throwing rocks at our friends' bedroom windows in order to wake them up. On this particular evening, we got a late start because Tyson's parents stayed up a little later than usual. We got out of the house around 3 a.m. We made our way towards the school. It was about a 30 minute walk from Tyson's house, and the walk was pretty uneventful. We found a abandoned soccer ball in the tree line, so we decided to kick it back and forth while we were making our way to school. The majority of this walk was along a green belt next to the forest in front of a row of houses. The green belt ended at the school's park. A small island of trees were in the middle of the school park, and that was our destination. It was where we stored the Playboys we stole from Tyson's dad. This being northern Canada, the nights didn't go completely black. It was more of a dark blue sky. It was also a full moon, so visibility was pretty damn good, even in the woods. We went out to the island, as they refer to it, and sat on the tree that was a hangout for people our age. Tyson went into the hiding spot where he pulled out the Playboy. It was under about 30 feet behind where I was standing behind the tree. Without warning, Tyson comes running out screaming to run. Now, don't get me wrong, Tyson was a great guy, but he was known for playing pranks like this. I was too, so I thought he was screwing around. Still in the woods in the middle of the night, my friend screaming though is not the time to question him. I ran as well. We ran for a lot longer than we'd normally do in these types of pranks. In fact, we ran about half the distance home. At least far enough to be able to see a good distance behind us. That was when we stopped running and we switched to a brisk walk to catch our breath. I asked Tyson to stop screwing around because I actually wanted to hang out there. He looked at me. He had a different look than what I was used to. He actually looked scared. Normally, he is terrible with holding in a laugh when it's this kind of prank. The look he was giving me, though, gave me immense goosebumps. I knew that he really was afraid. I asked him what happened. That was when he starts telling me about someone in the woods. He stutters as he's trying to tell me, Someone grab m my arm, he said. Bullshit! I said back, hoping that he was just playing this prank better than any prank I've ever seen him do before. He said that we needed to go home now, and I kept pushing him for more detail, but the brisk walk slowed. Tyson looked behind him and stops. We both have troubling, trouble breathing from the run still. We sprinted our hardest for almost five kilometers, and we needed a break. Tyson faces the direction where we were coming from and starts to tell me what happened. I was leaning down to get the playboy from the tree, and some guy was behind it. He grabbed my arm set and said, Mmm. The guy's pants were down, and the dude was fucking jacking off. Fuck off, was my immediate reaction to the story. 
Tyson said that he pushed a guy who fell when he ran just at the right moment. Tyson's face was needy. Tyson's face went noticeably pale. And then, out of nowhere, he yelled, Fuck! Run! He yelled, and I looked back, and here he comes, someone wearing all black. We still had a good distance to go, and it was hard to see, but I could tell he was walking at this point. We ran again for a short distance. We still hadn't caught our breath. We were running on adrenaline alone by this point. Since we had a good distance and rode, we were now well lit in the very straight and narrow. We slowed our pace to catch our breath again. So did a guy in black. We did this a few times, both of us constantly looking over our shoulder, making sure that this guy wasn't gaining distance, but no matter what happened, no matter how often we looked back, the guy was on our trail. There were houses nearby, but we still didn't want to get in trouble, and we didn't realize the severity of our situation that we were in, we just thought that it was just some pervert trying to scare us. Finally, I looked back, and the guy wasn't there anymore. We continued our pace down to Tyson's house. We snuck back up through his garage and locked the doors, and went straight into our sleeping bags. We both laid there motionless and silent for about 10 minutes, trying to piece together what just happened. I didn't believe the story Tyson told me. He just told me that the guy was following us. The adrenaline was starting to die down, and I was starting to get sleepy. We were getting the shakes that usually come along with that. That's when we heard something. It was a shh noise, but not from someone making it. It sounded like a mechanical device, like metal scraping against metal. It was coming from one of the empty rooms in the basement where we were sleeping. We were dead silent as we heard some rustling, and then we watched a doorknob start to turn. It was a lever-style doorknob. We could see it go down. That's when enough was enough. Tyson began screaming, Dad! And I did the same. I screamed for Tyson's dad like no one else did before. Tyson's dad came flying down the stairs, still in his whitey tighties, and asked what the hell was going on. We said someone's in the room. Tyson's dad was very big and very athletic of a man. A man that you didn't want to mess with. He swings the door open and turns on the light, but there's no one there. However, the window is open and there's dirty footprints on the floor. He runs outside, but doesn't see anything. He locks the windows and makes his move to the upstairs, to Tyson's room, which was beside his. He called the cops, but they told him that they weren't in any immediate danger, so they didn't come out. They just asked him to come in the morning and write a report. It was a small RCMP detachment that actually took care of the neighboring reserves, which is where they spent the majority of their time. We didn't sleep much that night, but when we finally did, we woke up and we talked about his dad and the situation. I was still rattled, so his dad agreed to walk me home. A couple of blocks away from Tyson's, towards my own house, we noticed a bunch of police cars. As we got closer, one of the officers looked over and started walking towards us. He asked if we noticed anything suspicious. He told us that a little boy was taken from his room in the middle of the night. They had just issued an Amber Alert, but nothing so far. That's when Tyson's dad told him about what happened to us. He still hadn't spoken to the police yet. He, he was going to do that once he got home. The police went straight back to Tyson's house, but by that point, the mother had vacuumed the prints and wiped the dirt off the walls, so there weren't any evidence. The story got the attention of everyone in our small town and a big portion of the province that we live in. The boy was missing for almost three weeks, and that's when he found his mangled body. Not too many details were given aside from the boy was raped, killed, in a violent and vicious way. The killer was never caught. We were questioned about the night many times, and it, it kept reminding Tyson and I how close he became to becoming victims. What if I didn't believe him and didn't run? What if that guy didn't fall when Tyson pushed him? What if Tyson's dad wasn't home that night? So many what ifs. We both had nightmares for many years, Tyson and I were a lot more 
Tyson's were a lot more serious than mine. He had begun to suffer serious anxiety. He stopped going outside. He changed so in so many horrible ways as he just became a constant reminder of what happened that night. I needed to get this negative experience out of my life, so Tyson and I stopped being friends. At the same time, his dad felt guilty for not telling the police. It was more urgent. He began drinking, to start taking prescription meds. Tyson's family fell apart in those next couple of years. At the age of 17, Tyson couldn't take it anymore, and... He ended his own life and left a note that simply said, Sorry, David. David was the boy who was raped and killed. I knew things were bad for me, too, and that was the point when my parents forced me into therapy. If they hadn't, I might be with Tyson right now. At least, it feels like that's the type of path I was on. Weird guys stole stuff from my house. I was seven years old and I was in my bedroom drawing when I saw someone enter my house from the front door, put a finger up to his lips in the shush motion, and proceeded to take things from my house. He was one of my mom's friends, so I thought that she said he could have them. Well, when my mom got out of the shower, I told her that he came to grab some stuff and she flipped out, called the cops and everything. After he got out of jail, he would stalk my backyard and stare through the windows, sometimes jiggling the doorknobs. The last time I saw him, we came home from the store, and I ran to my bedroom to see him crawling through my small bedroom window in the darkness. The police got a hold of him once again, and he was gone after that. I never did see that man again. Sophie's Birthday by Queen of the South When I was in fifth grade, something really weird happened. We had a classmate who moved to a different town and school at the beginning of the school year. Where I'm from, this is not common, so we all missed her and wondered how she was doing. Her name was Sophie. Anyway, I remember it was a Friday in January. It was cold, and as we were getting out of school, there was this lady standing outside a blue SUV handing out birthday card invitations. Are you in fifth grade? Come to Sophie's birthday. Oh, you know Sophie? I'm Sophie's mom. Come to her birthday party. Jump in. I peeked inside the SUV, and it was empty with a few balloons. No Sophie in sight, just a guy on the driver's seat. Something seemed fishy, so my friend and I went inside to get our teacher, and we told her about it. As this woman sees us coming out with an adult, she straight up jumped into the SUV and drove off. I don't know what happened. I don't think the cops were called, but they did reach Sophia's family. Not only did they live in a different state, but it wasn't even her birthday. So, Sophie's mom, let's not meet again. She tried to sell my son by AshGR613. This all happened in the last month. I have a sister-in-law who is a heroin junkie. She started on pills, but switched to heroin as it's cheaper and easier to procure. I always knew she was a selfish, rotten example of humanity. But having no idea how sick she really was until this... Uh, it started about three weeks ago, when I stopped by my mother-in-law's house with my four-year-old son. He loves his granny, and we had a few minutes for a visit. When we arrived, she was on the phone with her daughter and excitedly announced that little Jimmy was there to see her. She didn't mention myself being there and only continued chatting for a bit. About a half an hour later, I was in the bathroom and I heard my sister-in-law show up about two minutes later. After that, I head into the kitchen, and he was supposed to be with his grandmother, but there was no sign of him. I ask her where he is, and he tells me that her daughter had taken him out front to play. Noticing that his shoes were under the kitchen table, I snatched him up, stomped outside, annoyed that she didn't bother putting him on him before going outside. I step outside the door to see her boosting my little boy into a pickup truck, a man I didn't recognize behind a wheel. Obviously, one of her drug buddies, stingy, dirty hair, skinny, and haggard looking. I sprint across the lawn and grab her and push her out of my way so I can scoop up my boy. 
and pull him out of the truck. The sister-in-law immediately starts whining how they're just taking him for ice cream and I don't have to be such a, and I quote, bitch. I inform her that's my son and he's going nowhere without her even asking. Especially with one of her junkie friends in the car who has no car seat. She calls me a few choice names and takes off of a friend. I am given grief by my mother-in-law and husband for being mean to her while she is in such a fragile state. Two weeks later, my husband gets a frantic call from his mother that her sister-in-law, again, is in jail. And again, she has no money for bail. My husband does, and what he, he does what he always does. He heads out to bail her off. However, he finds out that her bail is anything beyond what we can afford. And over the next couple days, we find out what she exactly has done. She and her junkie friends borrowed the young daughter of an old friend to take out for ice cream. But instead of going to the local DQ, they take her to a crummy motel and leave her with a man in exchange for several hundred dollars. As they're going back to the truck, they score with their newfound wealth. They are surrounded by cops with guns drawn. Turns out the guy in the motel room was an undercover officer trying to bust heroin dealers from selling out of a seedy bar. I do not know how she came to the offer children in exchange for money, but the officer let her do it and set her up. Now she's exactly where she deserves to be, and I hope the judge doing the sentencing shows exactly no mercy. Creeper on the Phone by Whiskey Dixie This happened about six months ago. I was working at a local children's hair salon as a receptionist. It is a hair salon that is mainly for children's hair. It plays cartoons, and instead of the standard salon chairs, there were planes, cars, and other child-friendly chairs. I had only been working there for about three weeks. My job consisted of answering phones, taking appointments, and payments. The day was pretty average, and the phone rang. I ran over to grab it because the manager that was working was a real stickler about answering the phone and not letting it pick up to voicemail. I picked up the phone and said, Thank you for calling. This is Cheyenne. How can I help you? The caller ID had read unknown, and the man that spoke sounded like an older man. And this is how the call went. Hey, Cheyenne, how are you today? I'm doing well. How can I help you? Yes, yeah, Cheyenne, I have a question and I think you can answer for me. I'll try my best, I said, all the while this man sounds cheery. Oh, I think you'll give me the answer I want. Cheyenne, can I lick your asshole? I was so incredibly shocked, I didn't know what to say or do. The only thing that came out of my mouth was, excuse me, in a very loud tone. I thought that I had to have misheard him. My manager at this point, who was less than five feet away from me, gives me a look that could kill. She obviously didn't know what he had said and just had heard me being rude to someone over the phone. The man, calm as day while breathing heavily, said, Oh, Cheyenne, can I lick your sweet asshole? Okay, so I clearly heard him correctly and slammed the phone down. My manager, mid-haircut, walked over and was about to chew me out when she saw my face. I have red hair, and she said that my face matched my hair. I was so flustered, disgusted, and pissed. I explained what happened and had to whisper what the man had said. She was just as shocked as I was. The phone rings again, and I pick it up. The man's voice comes over the line, just repeating my name. I refused to answer the phone for the rest of the day. We had a lot of hang-up calls that day. I'm not sure what's more creepy. The fact that a grown man asked me that, or the fact that he called a children's store and said that. I was afraid that maybe he was out in the parking lot. So, nasty asshole liquor, let's not meet. I almost witnessed a child abduction by mysterious artist. This story happened around one to two weeks ago. I was in a Walmart with my mom just buying groceries. Well, that's not the most exciting thing in the world, I'll admit, but I went wandering off to go look at the video games that they had. While looking at the different headsets, I felt someone tug at the back of my shirt. I looked down and I saw a little kid dressed as Spider-Man looking up at me. 
Now, this is around Halloween time, so I'm not really concerned about the costume. It didn't really surprise me. Now, this kid looked to be about seven or eight years old, but I was just going off of the kid's height because the Spider-Man mask was on and I couldn't really tell any facial details. I smiled at the kid and said, Hello, Spider-Man. Do you need something? I've always been good with kids. The kid stood there for a moment and said something, but I couldn't really hear him well. They were still wearing a mask, but I heard a Spanish accent. I kept smiling and said, Can you say that again, Spidey? The kid giggled and replied, I lost my mama. Could you help? I nodded my head. Of course, I'd love to help a little web-slinging hero out. I held out my hand and the kid took it and I led him up to the front desk and told the employee that we had found a lost little Spidey in the video game section and that he was lost. The employee leaned over the counter and asked the little Spider-Man kid his name. They said his name to the employee and then over the announcer and speaker they announced it which he got yelled at because they weren't supposed to say lost child's names over the speaker. However, this was important, and this is a very important part that should come later on. There was a reason why they weren't allowed to announce lost children's names over the speaker. By the time my mom had texted me asking me where I was at, I told her about the situation and to come up to the front desk. I could tell that little Spider-Man was getting upset. I heard little sobs under the mask, so he bent down in front of him and said, Hey, Spidey! Uh, don't cry, your mom will be here soon. Uh, will a treat help you feel like your hero self again? Of course, the little Spider-Man said yes, and I let him over to pick something out from... by the cash register. They picked out one of those little monster chocolate things that contained a toy inside, and... I paid for it, and we went back over to find a woman standing at the desk. She looked to be in her late 40s, early 50s, had long, oily, blonde hair, and she stood at level to my mom, so she had to be about 5'1", 5'2". She was also white, which stood out to me, because I could tell the kid's hands and by his accent that he was of Spanish descent, possibly even originating from Mexico or Spain, because, I mean, I could easily tell that Spanish wasn't his first language either, but maybe they were adopted or their father was Spanish, I don't know. I didn't know. We walked over to my mom and the woman, the woman said, That's my child! She cried and hugged little Spider-Man. I could see the kid tense up when the woman hugged him. She scolded him, them by her name and took their little hand a little too hard and started to walk off without saying anything to me or my mom. The kid looked back at me and started to physically pull against the mom. Something was wrong and I could tell. I ran after the kid and their supposed mom and stopped him and then said, Hey, little Spidey, you forgot your treat and I handed it to him. The woman released the kid so they could get the treat from me. They then walked over to me and this guy, this little kid took his mask off. Now I could see that this wasn't in fact a little man, but it was a little girl. She had short black hair and a bob and big brown eyes, but they were full of tears. She whispered to me that that's not my mom. In three seconds, I had her in my arms and was fast walking back to the desk. The woman chased after me, screaming to give her child back, but stopped when she saw who was at the front desk. Little Spider-Man's real mom. She was a spinning image of the little girl that I had in my arms. Mama! The little girl wiggled out of my arms and into her mom's. I turned around to face fake mom, and she was sprinting off. There's no way in hell I was letting her get away, and I sprinted after her. I was able to tackle her in the parking lot. I didn't care what attention I brought to myself or what kind of trouble I got into. This person wasn't getting away. Security showed up seconds later because, one, the Walmart employee called when it was obvious someone was trying to abduct a child, and two... Some teenage dude was, well, trying to sprint after an old woman through Walmart. She was arrested, taken back into the store, where she was screaming like the little girl that was this other little girl's child. I went back over to my mom, out of breath, wheezing, because, well, I just ran through Walmart and a parking lot, and I had really bad asthma. The little girl and her mom were still there. The mom thanked me profusely, and little Spidey hugged one of my legs. I saw later the week that the woman's mugshot was in the newspaper and she was arrested. 
I'm guessing she knew this little girl's name because of the dumb Walmart employee and took advantage of it. So, weird ass lady who thinks taking kids dressed as Spider-Man is okay. Let's not meet and have fun in jail. Man Following Me by Toast778 This happened a number of years ago when I was around 12 or 13. It was around 9 p.m. and I was walking around a clothing store with my mom. There weren't many people in the store or even at the parking lot, considering they close at 10 p.m. Anyway, about 10 minutes in, I noticed this guy in a black jacket is appearing everywhere I am. This I found odd considering he was in a teen's clothing section with no kids and didn't seem to be looking around. Every time I saw him, he would either make eye contact with me or act like he was on the phone talking to someone. And my memory is a bit fuzzy, so I'm not sure if this even happened, but I vaguely remember him describing what seemed to be me to the person on the other line. Eventually, I found my mom and told her that there's a strange guy following us around, and she was creeped out, but didn't entirely believe me at first. He continued to follow me and my mom around the store. My mom, instead of going to an employee and alerting them, just decided to leave, which, in retrospect, wasn't the best idea, because he could have potentially followed us outside, or had an accomplice waiting. He never followed us, and there was no one outside, but it was definitely one of my creepier encounters. Terrifying True Encounter in the Los Padres Forest by Team Leoto. I want to quickly inform you that this story has been labeled not safe for work, so if you're going to listen to this, make sure you're at least 13 years old, and furthermore, in a place where you will not be judged. A schoolroom simply is not the best location. With that being said, let's start the story. In 1994, I was 23 years old, and I decided to go on a week-long camping trip alone to get my thoughts together. I had just graduated from college here in California, and I needed to make some decisions about my future. I decided to go camping in the Los Padres National Forest. I had been there before as a kid, and from what I remember, it was quite peaceful. I packed my things, drove to the park, and bought the week primitive camping pass I needed. I told my parents where I was going, and let me tell you, they were not too excited about me going alone, but as I am a male and well-built, they only asked that I pack a knife for protection, and I happily obliged. I parked my car and set forth down the trail that I had chosen. My plan was to hike to a small pond that was only 12 miles down the trail, and then spend my week there fishing, relaxing, and thinking about what I should do with the rest of my life. I hiked from the morning to about 6 p.m. and took my time taking pictures, eating my lunch, and even writing in my journal. At about 6 p.m. I finally reached a pond and I unpacked my tent and equipment and got ready to sleep. I was so tired that I passed out and did not wake up till the next morning. In the morning, I made some coffee and then I made a PB&J sandwich. I then threw my fishing blind into the pond, and over the next couple hours, I caught a couple of bluegill. And I was getting some much-needed solitude. I gutted my fish, and then I put them back in the water so they would stay cool for a couple more hours. I could make them for lunch. After this, I went back to my tent, and I decided to take a nap. And let me tell you, I fell asleep fairly fast. About 30 minutes into my nap, I was awoken by a woman crying hysterically from what seemed to be a few hundred meters away. I instinctively got up quickly, opened my tent, and turned towards where the, she was crying. What I saw scared me instantly. I saw a what appeared to be a naked woman about 70 meters away in what I would guess was her mid-40s walking in my direction. She had long brown hair that was tangled in her face and her face was just contorted in a way that made her cries much more frightening. This woman was filthy all over and bleeding from what I could only describe as her lower area. My first reaction was shock, but after a few more seconds, I cleared my head and ran in my tent to grab a knife. I then walked over to the lady who was still crying hysterically and I asked her what happened. As I got close, she reached out to me. As if to give me an embrace, I hesitantly gave 
her one of my hands to hold on to. And then we walked over to my tent. She didn't say a word. She just kept crying and leaning herself on me. When we got to my tent, I handed her some paper towels and some extra clothes I had. And then I asked her what the hell happened and if I could help clean up in any way. She ignored the towels and furthermore ignored the clothes and let them fall onto the ground. She then asked in a smoky, almost exhausted, low voice if she could lay in my bed. At first, I started to think that she must have been a rape victim of some kind. And her eyes, they told me that she definitely was. She then lay down on top of my sleeping bag and just kept crying and shaking. I decided to let her be for a while and started picking up my stuff. As I figured I'd have to run back to get her help. Get some help for this woman as there's no phone reception out there. After about 25 minutes, I collected up all my belongings and walked over to the tent to see if the woman had calmed down. I unzipped and looked inside. The woman was just laying, no longer crying, but just staring at nothing. I again asked her what had happened, but she didn't answer. I then begun to tell her that I'm going to go run and get some help. She could come with me or just stay until help arrived. Again, she said nothing. I then told her that I was going to run up to the ranger station and I would be back as soon as possible. I left with some water, some food, and started walking back towards the trail. As I got to the trail, I heard a man's voice yelling from across the pond at that point. I turned to where I heard a yelling and I saw a man about 200 meters away. He was also naked and had a long beard. And let's just say he had a lot of body hair. Not exactly the most well groomed. I could not understand what he was saying at first, but as he got closer, I could understand the words. I'm no good. I'm no good. He said in a low, almost unintelligible groan, so I freaked out to this point, frozen in fear. I was thinking about my options when I noticed a woman getting out of my tent and walking towards a man with arms wide open. He then began running towards her, and then she towards him. When they reach each other, they embrace. At this point, I was totally confused and in shock about what in Sam hell was actually happening. I stood there and watched whatever was happening. After what seemed like 30 minutes, they let go of each other, and I could see them talking. The woman pointed towards me and then pointed towards her stomach. They then talked for a little longer, and both of them started walking towards me. I again stood there trying to figure out what the hell was going on. As they got within 50 meters of me, the woman and the man both simultaneously yelled at me, You can help us! I was still confused and yelled back at him. Uh, with what? What can I help you with? What the hell happened? The man and female did not reply, but only put their arms out in a baby swaddling position, a universal signal for baby. I yelled that back at them. What baby? In a concerned voice, the man said, I'm no good. We need you for the baby. I then said, I really don't understand. I started to take a few steps back. At this point, the woman grabbed what appeared to be two large rocks from the ground and handed one to the man. They began running towards me. I was terrified and dropped my backpack on the ground and started sprinting as fast as I could down the trail. I, I could hear them screaming at me, we need your help with the baby, over and over again. I could hear them scrambling down the trail behind me. They had no shoes and the trail was very rocky so I knew if they kept running they wouldn't be able to keep it up for very long. After about 15 minutes I slowly heard the cries die down to the point where I could no longer hear them. It took me about 6 hours to get to the ranger station with me running, and then taking a break when I needed to. When I got to the ranger station, I threw open the door and began explaining what the hell just happened to the ranger. He knew I was serious from the emotion I conveyed, and told me that I was going to get some backup to go out there, and check out the situation and retrieve my belongings. He advised me just to sit tight in the ranger station while he got back up and that they would be riding their ATVs out there within an hour. I told him that I would rather just go home, and that if he could just call me after they investigated the situation, he said okay. 
I drove about two hours home and told my family what happened and then waited for them on the phone to call. I ended up falling asleep on my parents' bed like a child would. It's kind of embarrassing, I'm sorry. The next morning, my father woke me up and told me that he had just gotten off the phone with the ranger and that they had taken the naked man and woman into custody. They told my father that the two people would not identify themselves and they found them on a trail walking back into the direction of the pond. This is scary because we are still walking. We were still walking when the rangers found them. It, it means that they pursued me for a lot longer than I originally thought. The man and woman have been taken to a psychiatric hospital and both were identified as schizophrenic individuals. Nothing else is really known about them. They couldn't figure out who they were or how they'd gotten to that location. That is all they could tell us. As far as my equipment, I told them that I didn't want any more. As much as I'm sure it's caked in blood from who knows what. We found out a few months later that the couple had set up a hidden campsite near the edge of the pond area and that the rangers had found one grave of a very small, miscarried fetus. The man and woman were identified as a married couple who had gone off their medication and decided to move out to the woods and live away from society for a very long time. They, from what everyone guessed, had tried to start a family out there, but due to malnutrition, the woman had a miscarriage. I guess the man blamed himself for being no good and wanted me to take his place, and... I don't even want to think. Uh, this is by far the creepiest thing that ever happened to me, and I have never am going to be going camping again. This forever changed me as a person and made me very wary of strangers. I hope no one has to experience what I did. Or at least what I had to experience with those crazy people. So, strange... Uh, sick, mentally ill people. Let's not meet again. Through the Window by Two Blazed Two so I live in a small town in Australia. It's a quiet, nice town, but there's an ice epidemic and the crime rate has risen. Fuck loads of kangaroos, too. Unfortunately, I live on the edge of the bad part of town, and there are plenty of sketchy people around. Across the road is an old lady who lives alone at a brick house. About a month ago, the old lady was going about her usual Friday afternoon, heading to the local bolo to push some buttons. Anyway, when she comes home, she goes to her spare room to call her daughter before heading to bed. When she enters the room, the first thing she notices is that her window has been smashed open. The hole in the window was big enough for a man to climb through. She immediately phones the cops and hides in the bathroom until they come in the house, 20 minutes later. Now the creepy part. The police searched the area and found a man hiding in the bushes of the backyard. The man turned out to be a sex offender who had been released only two days beforehand. He had served 30 years for the assault of two other women, both also elderly, and had just gotten off parole. He had stalked her and waited until she left, jumped the fence into her backyard and smashed the window, then hid in the bushes until she arrived home, planning to attack her. The man didn't put up a fight to the police, instead calmly letting them arrest him. The lady said that he stared at her intently as they ducked his head under the door into the paddy wagon. Creepy guy in the bushes? Let's not meet. Saddle Shoes by Snacktaculi This story technically was my mother's, but it was somewhat affected by my siblings and me as well. My mom grew up in South Florida, and this whole event started in the early 70s. She was a senior in high school and met a guy at a wedding. He was a drummer in the wedding band, and was a few years older than her, and therefore... He was cool, the mysterious guy that I'm sure you know many girls actually kind of dream of. They immediately hit it off, and he commented on her saddle shoes that she was wearing at the time. She gave him her phone number, and I believe they maybe went on one or two dates, and everything seemed totally fine. He would regularly call the house, and she would sit on the kitchen floor and talk to him. One night, the conversation took a weird turn. He started asking her things like, Have you ever thought about killing yourself? 
And do you ever think about murdering people? Obviously, she was shocked at this and got very uncomfortable and completely stopped talking to him. This is the last time she heard from him. Or so she thought. It was 2012 and I had just graduated from college. I was hanging out in my college town to finish out my lease and work and maybe figure out my next move. My mom calls me and says something's weird and something's been going on. She tells me that she's received this letter from this man she knew in high school. I had no idea who this guy was at the time as she never mentioned him at all to me, my siblings, or my dad up until this point. She explained to me who this man is and how she knew him, but hadn't spoken to him since that one uncomfortable phone call. The letter said something along the lines of, I see you're happy and married with kids, but he goes on to mention each of us by name. He also mentions my dad's name and where he works. My parents met in college in another state, and they quickly married, graduated college, and moved to yet another state, and then another state once my two sisters were born. She had no idea how he knew that she was now married, with a new name, new address, and she's never been on social media, and once she had all of us kids, she completely stopped working. If you were to Google her name, you would not even find anything, either under the old or new name. She then recalls getting a phone number from the alumni association at her college telling her that the man has been calling on and off for months trying to get her contact information but they weren't allowed to give out that info without strict permission. She then tells me his name and I remember having a Facebook friend request and a Twitter follow from this man. My siblings all had the same request as well. My mom, having no social media like I mentioned, asked me if I could dig around his social media accounts and see what I could find. I find a music MySpace and a River B Nation page of some sorts. Really terrible music he had, by the way. One of the songs that he recorded and uploaded was called Victoria, which is my mother's name. All of the other songs seemed completely normal, with titles like Summer Days, etc. I tell my mom this and she freaks out. I sent her a link and it's hard to make out the lyrics because the quality is so bad, but he mentions her as saddle shoes, her beauty, etc. They literally hung out twice 40 years ago and these were songs that had been recorded fairly recently. I dig deeper and find out that he's made a website dedicated to freeing Amanda Knox the woman accused of murdering her roommate in Italy. This was super alarming at the time, but I've since not put too much weight on that since her innocence is actually very possible, but it's still a very strange opinion to hold. My dad didn't seem phased by any of this. My mom was freaked out and wouldn't even stay home alone since this man apparently now knows her address. She ends up telling this to all of her family friends and a private investigator and he decides to do some digging on this guy. First of all, he's changed his last name. Secondly, he's moved into five different states in the last 20 years under different aliases and working completely different jobs. There wasn't much that could be done since he never actually threatened my mom somehow. And he didn't have a record. He still pops up every now and again with a friend request to me and my siblings, but other than that, no one really knows what his deal is. The fact that he moves around quite a lot and changes his name is definitely a red flag. I personally think this dude is fucked up in some way. And if he's not, he's just a sad, lonely, mentally unstable dude who needs to get a grip on life. But stalker, musician, man, whatever. Uh, let's not meet. I know this says 20 Let's Not Meet stories, however, someone on Patreon kindly asked if I would narrate his story, and as a bonus for you guys, I would like to read this guy's story. He also has a YouTube channel which can be found linked in the description below. His name is Kaiba Curtis. With that being said, let's move on to the final Let's Not Meet story, and then the end card. Neighborhood Kids 
by Kaiba Curtis. So, I'm going to try my best to remember everything, as I'm only 22 years old, and this happened when I was 6 or 7. My name is Jay, and this happened when I was around that age. You know, the age when I lived with my mom and her stepdad in a small town in Washington State. We also had a small cul-de-sac and a field next to us, maybe a junkyard as well. As I just moved, I was a tad shy and didn't know anyone. I kind of just sat outside until I saw other kids. That's when I finally did see kids, and they looked to be about 12 or 13, much older than my own age bracket. It didn't matter to me though, I wanted someone to play with. I went over, introduced myself, and we eventually played tag or something. But because of the field, of course, we kids ventured over there. Once in the field of weed or whatever the hell was there, I noticed a single tree knotted and twisted and bent in a few angles, growing in the middle. Also, the only one in this field I could see. So really, there is just only one strange tree in the middle of some goddamn field in the middle of nowhere. So we went over it, and there were about two things off that I could see about it. One, it had a patio and deck around it. And second, it had a rope draped over the low branch. The tree looked about 20 years old, and the deck looked even older. We went up the stairs and noticed the rope wasn't really tied down. But it did have the loop at the end of it. So we lowered it and we started to swing from it. And yes, I know, I honestly thought it was a rope swing, but when one person swung or stood on the rope, the other kids had to hoist them up. And that's what we did when one of the kids looked at me and said, Hey, stick it around your neck and let's see if you can be lifted into the tree. As a child, I didn't think anything of it and obliged. They all started hoisting me up as I held the rope around my neck, and I rose. Eventually, after maybe a minute, my arms got tired and slipped off the hoop or, or the noose. As I realized, th the older one tightened it around my neck, and I was hanging. That's that's when I heard a kid who told me to, to start doing this laughing. A and not in a nice way, but in the way that was really messed up. His weird laughing was different than normal. And I realized something was wrong and I was in trouble. So hanging from the tree, hang, being held up by kids laughing at me, and not laying me down no matter how hard I struggled, I started to get lightheaded and I felt chest pains from, well, having issues breathing. I, I remember before I could black out, I heard a voice yelling something in the distance, and then the kids let go of the rope, and then immediately ran off. I fell to the ground and I laid there until I could breathe. And then, I started running home. I was in shock. I think because I wasn't crying or hysterical. When I got back to my house, my mom was standing there, very angry that I had run off where she couldn't see me. And in fear, I didn't tell her what happened. Also, I like to note, my dog went missing later that week. And I would also like to note, I never saw those kids when I went outside again. But other people always said bad things about those troublemakers. Never found my dog. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm sure they had something to do with it. So, to those kids who tried to hang me, let's not meet again. I can't imagine you're anywhere else but prison at this point. Hello guys, I'm here again. While I was editing the video, it turns out that I didn't even hit the hour mark. So I decided to give you guys an extra encore on top of that encore. So enjoy the now 22 Let's Not Meet stories that you're getting for the price of one. With that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the next tale. Mom and the Creepy Girl at Our Door by Sweet Oblivion. When I was growing up, my older brother raced flat track motorcycles, and as a result, my dad and him were gone most weekends during the racing season. Sometimes my mom and my younger sister and myself would tag along, but my mom was really never into it, so she would keep my sister and me at home, at least most of the time. 
and then she would plan fun things for us to do during the weekend. This incident happened on one of the weekends where we stayed home back in 1987. So, I was about 10, and my sister was possibly around 8. It started out like any other Saturday, with my dad and brother gone. My mom then took us out to eat at McDonald's. We then went to a mall, and then we quickly came home to play some Monopoly and watch some cable television. At around 10 p.m., my sister and I started to get sleepy, so my mom brought out the sleeping bags for all three of us to sleep in the living room together. I had asked my mom years later uh, what time this was, because as a kid, I didn't pay much attention to the clock. So, around 2 p.m., someone starts banging on our front door. Our front door is pretty strange. It pretty much has four large panels of glass that weren't opaque, so they were covered with small curtains. We all wake up at the sound of this pounding. And quickly, we rush to the door and look out one of the windows. And there's this girl at the door. She's probably in her late teens, early 20s. And I remember her wearing a white and blue windbreaker. She's frantic and crying and begging my mom to let her in because she said her boyfriend is chasing her. And she's afraid that he's going to kill her. My mom remained calmed as hell in a scary situation and said, I'm sorry, love. But I, I can't let you in because I got two young children with me and I can't risk your boyfriend harming them if he gets in. I could call the police for you if you stay here. Of course, that didn't sit well with the girl as she started crying more and more and pointing to her foot that was broken in a cask. Please, ma'am, you have to let me in. He's coming for me. Again, my mom politely refused and turned to run to the kitchen and called 911. Our phone is mounted on the wall in the kitchen with a ridiculously long cord so she is able to get back to the door with phone on hand and with dispatch and told that her that the police was on the way. This made the girl surprisingly go even more crazy. I don't need the damn police because I will be dead before they get here. My mom then apologized again and said that she was sorry but she wasn't going to open the door. At this point, the girl turned around and started to walk off into the darkness. About five to seven minutes later, the police show up. My mom gave a statement. As she's doing so, my dad and brother come home from the race. My dad didn't even turn off the truck. He just ran up, terrified, asking what the hell's going on. While my mom is telling my dad what happened, another officer walked up and said that he didn't see anyone, but found a shoe in the street in front of our house. The police left, and we all sat in the living room for a bit to decompress, and I remember thinking that maybe my mom wasn't very being very nice to that girl, and she should have just let her in. Fast forward to 2001, and it's about a week after I had my first son. Family and friends are here at my house and dotting on the baby. After most people leave, there's just my parents, my sister, and my son sitting in my living room this time. And I made a comment about how I didn't really love the neighborhood that we moved to. But I was proud of actually having my own house and my own family. Then my sister says, Hey, Mom, remember that lady that came to our house demanding to come in? My mom says, Yeah? Yeah, I know. I remember her very well. At this point... I could tell that my mom and dad were not comfortable talking about it because they gave each other this weird nervous glance. So my sister, being the asshole that she can always be, why didn't you just let her in? I wonder if her boyfriend actually did end up killing her. My dad then interjects and said that my mom did the right thing because it was late and we were home alone. And then he adds a little end to it. Uh, plus they ended up finding her in a car with her boyfriend smoking dope a few blocks over. They had rope, duct tape, two shovels, and a ton of knives in the trunk. Both my sister and I said, what the hell, in unison. I asked why we were never told about this, and my dad said that they decided not to tell us this at a young age because we wouldn't feel safe in our own home. Finding out that made me feel like a huge jerk because I always thought that my mom was being somewhat rude. Now, now that my mom likely just prevented a home invasion 
and judging by what was found in the car, it's quite possible that they prevented three murders as well. Learning about that still sends chills down my spine. Even writing about it now gives me goosebumps. I don't know where this girl is now, but I hope we never meet again. Hello ladies and gentlemen, you made it to the end of the video, but I got a request for you. I want to bring back Crappy Pots as a show that ruins your childhood one episode at a time. But in order to do that, I need to find stories, so if you'd be so kind to scour crappypasta.com or to some ordinary gamers wiki and help me find the worst of the worst so I can promote the best of the best, send it to my email which is on screen right now. In the meantime, if you haven't seen part 1, go check it out, or if you'd like to check out my top 20 lost horror media, that should still be up too. I'm working my ass off to make sure that we get more videos this month, so expect more content to be coming fairly soon.